In Magic and most competitive card games, cards are usually banned because they're too powerful and pose a significant threat to the competitive integrity of the game. However, once in a while, Wizards prints a card that has to be banned for a completely different reason. So today, we're going over cards that were banned or restricted to one copy for really weird reasons. Start us off at number 10, we have Divine Intervention. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 6 and 2 white. It has the abilities where it enters the battlefield with two intervention counters on it. At the beginning of your upkeep, you remove an intervention counter from it, and when the last one is removed, the game is a draw. Now, this card is pretty terrible. Generally, if you're paying 8 mana for something, you need it to basically win you the game right there. Paying 8 mana for a card and then having to wait 2 more turns for it to actually do anything is really bad, especially when all it does is draw the game. Interestingly, if the card had just won the game instead of drawing it, it likely wouldn't have been banned. You see, this card was mostly banned due to how unfun of an effect it is to play against. Wizards doesn't want people going to tournaments and losing to an effect like this. They felt that they would likely leave them with a very negative impression of the game and would make them less likely to continue playing it in the future. On top of that, the card also encourages players to play for a draw. Now, playing for a draw is pretty accepted in situations, like if you're going to time and you're up a game in a tournament, but there's a big difference between drawing being the best way to preserve your tournament record and drawing being the main strategy of your deck. All in all, Wizards just doesn't like the play patterns this card incentivized and banned the card to stop them. Ever since Divine Intervention was printed, Wizards has never printed another card that intentionally draws the game. Celestial Convergence is the closest thing we've gotten, but it only draws the game if both players have the same amount of life when the effect goes off. It seems like Wizards learned their lesson after Divine Intervention and moved away from cards that draw the game. The card is currently unbanned, but it did spend some time on the ban list early in the game's lifespan. And at number 9, we have Cauldron Familiar. This is a 1-1 cat with a mana cost of 1 black. It has the abilities where, when it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. You can also sacrifice a food to return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. Foods are an artifact token with the ability where you can pay to tap and sacrifice them to gain 3 life. This card was actually extremely powerful back in its standard format, and has currently seen some play in Pioneer with the help of Witch's Oven. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 1 and the ability where you can tap it and sacrifice a creature to make a food token. And if the sacrificed creature's power has 4 or more, you can make a second food. This is deceivingly powerful. While all it really does is drain one life from your opponent in return, there are lots of ways to make this even better. Because of how combat works in Magic, you can do things like block an attacking creature with the cat and then sack it to your oven to make a food. And the creature you block won't do any damage to you because it was blocked already. If the creature has something like lifelink, this can get you even more value. This was strong enough that Wizards decided the card needed to be hit in standard, but that wasn't their only reason. Wizards also specifically cited the number of triggers this card creates and how cumbersome it could be to resolve on digital platforms as a reason for the card's ban. You see, on platforms like Arena, where a trigger goes onto the stack, each player has to manually pass priority before it can resolve. This means that a series of game actions that would normally take a couple of seconds at most in paper can take up to 5 seconds to resolve on Arena. And when you're doing this every turn, this adds up fast. Wizards will usually allow these kinds of things in older formats like Modern Legacy, as players who play those formats are usually pretty established players. But Arena is competing directly with other digital card games that are much snappier to play. So Wizards may have wanted to make the game more fun for them by banning this card. All in all, this makes Cauldron Familiar one of the more unique bans in Magic. And at number 8, we have Loris of the Dream Den. This is a 3-2 Legendary Cat Nightmare with a mana cost of 1 and 2 hybrid black-white mana, which can be paid with either white or black mana. It has Companion. Each permanent card in your starting deck has a mana value of 2 or less. This means at the start of the game, if you meet this requirement, you can reveal this card from your sideboard and then later, you can pay 3 mana to put it from your sideboard into your hand. It has the ability where, once per turn, you can cast a permanent spell with a mana value 2 or less from your graveyard. Loris is an infamously powerful card. It has been banned in a ton of formats, but the most interesting ban was in Vintage. You see, Vintage's whole thing is that they don't usually ban cards in that format. Rather, they simply restrict them to one copy. Loris was extremely powerful in this format, as cards like the ludicrously strong Black Lotus are at one in Vintage. This made Loris extremely bannably strong before the Errata to a Companion. Back then, you could simply cast them from your sideboard rather than having to pay 3 to put them into your hand. This means with the Lotus, you could crack it to take 3 mana, cast Loris, and then recast your Lotus from the graveyard, giving you a Black Lotus every turn and not losing you out on your turn 1 Lotus. This meant the card needed to be banned, but restricting it wouldn't do anything. You see, since you can only have one companion, and having extra Lorises in your deck would break your companion requirement, decks would only ever play one Loris anyway. So, restricting it wouldn't do anything. This led to one of the very few power level bans in Vintage's history. At least, until the companion mechanic was eroded and things like Black Lotus Slime were made impossible, or at least much more difficult. And at number 7, we have Aetherworks Marvel. 
This is a legendary artifact with a mana cost of 4. It has the abilities where, whenever a permanent you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you gain 1 energy. You can also pay 6 energy and tap it to look at the top 6 cards of your library, cast one of them without paying its mana cost, and put the rest of them in the bottom of your library in a random order. This card has a very strong effect. If you're able to hit a very expensive card and cast it for free, you can often essentially end the game on turn 4. The card of choice in standard was Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. This is a 10-10 legendary Eldrazi creature that costs 10 mana. It has the ability where, whenever you cast it, you exile two target permanents. It also has indestructible, meaning it can't be destroyed by damage or destroy effects. It also has the ability where, whenever it attacks, you exile the top 20 cards of the defending player's library. This card would basically win the game if you spun into it on turn 4, and counter spells wouldn't even help, because Ulamog's trigger to eat two permanents triggers as soon as you cast it, meaning you got to kill two of your opponent's lands right then, essentially taking them out of the game. The deck had plenty of ways to get the energy needed by turn 4, such as Woodweaver's Puzzle Knot, which could make 6 energy on its own. Now, while this was powerful, it was pretty inconsistent. You would only get the combo off about 10% of the time by turn 4, and if you weren't doing the combo, your deck was pretty bad. This meant that the deck actually had a pretty lousy win rate, with most of the good decks in the meta beating it 55% of the time or more. So, why was this card banned in Standard? Well, because the combo was annoying to deal with. All sorts of players, from casual players to the pros, were complaining about how unfun and uncompetitive this deck was to play against. It was basically a deck that you just auto-lost to 10% of the time, and there wasn't that much you could do to even prepare for the matchup. As a result, Wizards felt that the format was better off without Marvel in it. And at number 6, we have Yurian the Sky Nomad. This is a 4-5 legendary bird serpent with a mana cost of 3 and 2 white-blue hybrid mana. It has Companion, your starting deck has 20 more cards than the minimum deck size. It has Flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach, and the ability where, when it enters the battlefield, you exile any number of non-land permanents you both own and control, and return them to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. This is another Companion, and this card was extremely good in a number of formats. Tons of decks were able to play 20 extra cards in order to get an additional late game threat, and the card was even stronger thanks to its ability to let you reuse strong enter the battlefield effects. However, this power didn't have all that much to do with the card being banned. You see, Yurian's companion requirement making you play a bigger deck worried Wizards because it made your deck a lot harder to shuffle, and this worried Wizards enough that the card was banned in Modern. The interesting thing is that they only banned the card in Modern, not in any of the other mini formats that the card is legal and seen play in. The card remains legal in Pioneer and Legacy. Sure, Pioneer requires less shuffling due to not having the fetch lands legal, but they are legal in Legacy, and Yurian is seen play there. It's ultimately a strange decision, and lots of players are speculating that this card's ban might have some ulterior motives that Wizards hasn't mentioned, but there's no way to confirm that one way or the other. And at number 5, we have Contract from Below. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 1 black, and has the text where you have to remove it from your deck before a game starts if you're not playing for ante, and the effect where you discard your hand and add the top card of your deck to the ante, then draw 7 cards. So, before we continue, we need to explain what ante is, or rather, was. Ante was a mechanic where, at the start of the game, both players would put the top card of your library into a separate ante pile, and whoever won the game would get to keep both cards. As in, they now own those cards. This had a ton of issues. First off were the legal issues. In some places, this would qualify as gambling, and would require magic to operate under a very different series of restrictions. The second issue is how this would make parents look at the game. Magic, especially in the early days, is marketed towards younger teenagers and preteens, and parents would be a lot less keen to buy their kids the cards if they found that the game involved gambling. Another big issue, possibly the biggest of them all, is that no one liked the mechanic. No one wants to spend a bunch of time, effort, and money building a deck only to lose a key card in a game. Another issue is how this would work in tournaments, or rather how it wouldn't work. It doesn't really make any sense for players to lose or gain cards in the middle of a tournament. They would need to have extra copies of all their cards on hand just in case they lose one of them to an ante. So Ante was very quickly removed from the game, and all the cards that mention Ante were banned in every format. Contract is on here representing all of these cards, though it's worth noting this card would have been banned anyway, even if it wasn't an Ante card. One mana to draw a fresh 7 card hand with basically no downside is simply far too strong. Cards like Time Twister, Wheel of Fortune are banned in Legacy and restricted to 1 in Vintage to this day due to how strong this effect is. The Ante cards are some of the only cards banned in Vintage. And at number 4, we have Chaos Orb. This is an artifact with a mana cost of 2. It has the ability where you pay 1 and tap it, then, if it's on the battlefield as the effect resolves, you flip it over the table from a height of at least 1 foot. If it flips over at least once, you destroy all non-token permanents it's touching, and then you destroy Chaos Orb, 
Before we get started, we should mention that Falling Star is a card with a similar effect that's banned for the same reason as Chaos Orb. So, why is this card banned? There are several reasons. First off, accessibility. Magic isn't a game that usually requires dexterity tests, and usually most people with disabilities can play the game with no issues. However, the really big issue is logistics. Here's a question. What's the best counterplay to Chaos Orb? Well, it's to play with all your permanents so far away from each other that your opponent can't ever destroy more than one of them. This causes a ton of issues. Players would take up far too much room in tournament settings. Not to mention the rules on when you're allowed to do things like rearrange your board while there's a Chaos Orb in play. Players often have to rearrange their board to communicate the game state better, and this isn't allowed while Chaos Orb is on the board, because otherwise it'd be going against how the card was designed. You can see how wizards learn their lesson in future sets with cards like Slain Mantis in the Unsets, Magic's joke sets. Mantis has the ability just a second, which means the player can't move the cards in the battlefield while it's on the stack. It also enters the battlefield by being thrown from a distance of at least 3 feet, and it fights each creature it lands on. This effect is obviously only allowed in joke sets, as it still has all the issues we've mentioned in actual competitive play, but you can see how this card fixes a lot of the issues with Chaos Orb, as rather than sitting around and making it so the players can't rearrange the board, it only applies the effect while it's being cast. While we're on the topic of joke sets, let's quickly go over Chaos Confetti. This is an artifact from a joke set with a banner cost of 4. It has the ability where you can pay 4 and tap it, then you tear the card into pieces and throw the pieces onto the battlefield from a distance of at least 5 feet and destroy any permanent a piece of the card is touching, then you remove the pieces of Chaos Confetti from the game. This card is actually a reference to an old magic story, where a player ripped up their Chaos Orb while resolving the effect, and the judge of the event apparently ruled in their favor. Chaos Orb is now banned in every format, but it's a very strange and interesting piece of magic history. And at number 3, we have Rook Egg. This is a 0-3 bird egg with a mana cost of 3 and 1 red. It has the ability where, whenever it dies, you create a 4-4 red bird creature token with flying at the beginning of the next end step. Now, this card as printed has no issues. However, this is a reprint of the card. The original printing had a big issue. This version of the card read, If Rook Egg is put into a graveyard, a Rook, a 4-4 red flying creature, comes into play on your side at the end of turn. Use a counter to represent Rook. Rook is treated like a normal creature, but if it leaves play, it is removed from the game entirely. The big issue with this wording, outside of the normal, early magic lack of any common sense templating, is the fact that it says it triggers whenever Rook Egg is put into a graveyard, not when it dies, or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield. This means that it would trigger if Rook Egg was put into the graveyard in any way. Rook Egg was printed in Arabian Nights, the same set as Bazaar of Baghdad, a land that you can tap to draw two cards and discard three. These two cards were extremely powerful together, if you interpreted Rook Egg's ability as written, rather than how the game designers of magic intended. It was supposed to be an on-death trigger, but at this point of the game, there was no way to fix cards that were printed wrong. Gatherer and other forms of errata weren't practical at the time, so rather than try to fix the card, wizards just banned it. Well, they actually restricted one copy, which considering the issue was a templating, is an even weirder choice. However, wizards seems to have decided that simply trying to errata it with the limited technology at the time was better than restricting it, because it was unrestricted a month later. Rook Egg remains the only card banned due to a wording issue in Magic, though there is a card with a similar story. And at number 2, we have Orcish Aura Flam. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 3 and 1 red, and the ability where attacking creatures you control get plus 1 plus 0. However, this isn't how the card was originally printed. In Alpha, the first set of magic, Orcish Aura Flam was printed with a mana cost of 1 and 1 red, instead of its mana value of 4. This created a few issues. First off, the lack of errata meant that the card played differently based on which version you had, which was obviously a pretty huge issue for a competitive game. However, it seems like one of the reasons the card was restricted early on in the game had to do with power level concerns. At the time, a 2-min enchantment that gives all your creatures a power boost was considered extremely powerful. Creatures in general were a lot worse back then. In the early days of the game, cards like Savannah Lions and Elvish Archers were considered so strong they needed to be rares. Giving your board a power boost for just 2 mana was obviously a lot more impactful at this point of the game, and it seems Wizards was actually pretty concerned about it being too good. Combine this with the issues concerning the misprint, and Wizards felt the need to restrict the card in the game's very first ban list. However, like Rook Egg, it was quickly taken off the restricted list in just a month. And at number 1, we have Shaharazad. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of 2 white. It has the effect where the players play a magic subgame using their current library as their decks, and each player who doesn't win the subgame loses half their life. Round it up. This is a pretty infamous card for just how annoying and frustrating it can be. Playing an entire game of magic just to adjust one player's life total in a single game is extremely frustrating. However, the worst part is how you can repeatedly use the card in a single game if you want to. 
Your deck can have a total of 4 copies of Sherazad in it, meaning you can play up to 4 subgames in one game, or even play subgames within a subgame. However, you can make this even worse by copying Sherazad with a card like Thousand Year Storm. You can make tons of copies of Sherazad, effectively forcing your opponent to play subgame after subgame just to finish one game. This is pretty awful for a tournament setting. Certain cards have been banned before due to time issues such as Sensei's Divining Top, but Sherazad really takes the cake here. The amount of time it can stall you for will easily make matches go to time, and often make it so that you can't even finish one real game of a match, forcing the game to be a draw. For as annoying as Divine Intervention was, at least it was fairly hard to actually pull off. Sherazad is far, far better at forcing draws. Considering how bad this card would be for a tournament, it's not surprising the card is banned in everything, including Vintage. However, there's another reason this card is banned beyond time. The fact is, it's just a really unfun card to play with. Playing sub-games can be a fun and wacky thing to do every once in a while, which is why the effect has appeared on a few unset cards later on in the game's life. But playing it in a normal game, and running into it even somewhat consistently, makes the game a real drag to get through. This card is banned for so, so many reasons outside of being strong. It's annoying, uncompetitive, causes draws, and is a huge headache for tournament play. All of these are reasons enough to ban the card, but having this many issues makes it by far the card that was banned for the weirdest reasons. Alright, and that's the video. Are there any other cards that were banned for really weird reasons that we may have missed? Or do you have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, we'd love to hear about them down in the comments below.